Hey, hey, hey! Today we're going to be talking to the amazing Antoinette Messon. Listen to this, okay? She did Creek, have 95% of Rotten Tomato. And the harder they fall, you won two awards. Mm -hmm. They are Black Reel and Cap Cat. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that later, by the way. Mm -hmm. Canadian thing. <laughs> 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 the Buff, the amazing movie. The book Clarence. Clarence. Yeah, book of Clarence. You did that with your long time collaborator. Uh, his name is James Samuel. Liz, Secret Headquarter, and my favorite, Cult Classic, the Gently Holistic Detective Agency. Wow. <laughs> I appreciate that you love the Dirk Gently series. I had so much fun on that series. I love how innovative thing move around, the way yeah. it shot, the, the clothing have a story of its own. Absolutely. I think it was the first time I really got to play with color. Because I normally, before that, I was doing all these horror movies or horror series, very dark, dark, dark. And then I got this series and it was like 360 degrees, yellow really? leather wow. coats. And I mean, I had all of the lead actors' leather coats done in London by the original Lewis Leather Company that used to do bikers jackets in, from the 20s. Yeah. And um, I saw vintage yellow leather coat. And when I found out who made it, I went right to the source and it was Lewis Leathers in London. And I couldn't find anyone else who was making that kind of color in iconic styles. Did I like because I think like clothing was part of the story of that Thank whole uh, yeah so it, it yeah I, I love you're it. the first person to ever mention that <laughs> I like you now <laughs> thank you what your favorite time of the day and how does it inspire you creativity oh wow I wish I was a morning person I absolutely am not even over thirty plus years in this business it kills me to get up early I am a night bird I love I I actually find my second wind after 9 p.m. And that's sometimes when I'm probably the most creative, I get the most done. By then, most of my prep crew has left for the day, so it's just me. And oh, I don't mind, nice yeah, that nice, well, I put music on, I'll be honest. <laughs> but at least it give, gets me in a space of being able to knock it out without interruption, it just flows. And sometimes it's not at work, it could be at home, but um, I'll be the first one to admit I accomplish the most of my creativity after hours, like late. Yeah, I did a lot of my most creative work at like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Right? And people, <laughs> people get emails from me and the first thing I say to my team is, listen, I'm going to apologize in advance, you may get emails and texts and all that kind of stuff at off hours but that's when my brain is moving that's when i'm flowing because i just feel like i troubleshoot throughout the day or i'm delegating or workshopping something and in the night when it's as you say the quiet of in less noise of traffic and people is when i i get to really pump it out so yeah you're recentering yeah. and then that when everything kind of fall in place and you know what you yeah I don't to see plan <laughs> who would you like to have coffee with living on that and why wow the questions Adam the questions <laughs> um, you know as I sit here two people come to mind and it's like who do I talk about I mean they're as different as night and day um, Andrew Leon Talley comes mm, to mind. To be fascinated. Right? And I saw a documentary at, a, at TIFF, and he came and he spoke, and it was so interesting and just deep, hmm. you know? When you think about this man started in a time that no one else looked like him. No. Nope. And it was a height of you know, two very different types of fashion. You had the hippie, you know, group, and then you had the high fashion. You had the Halstons, he was in New York. And he then went to Paris. And I just wanted to know, I mean, he talks about the influence of his grandmother, but I was just so 
curious to know what inspired or drove you to keep in that lane. You just kept and pushing. And it's not easy. No, it, it wasn't, wasn't easy. easy. And he just kept climbing yeah. from one position to another. And obviously he was talented so that they continued to support his climb. But what drove him? Yeah. I'd love to ask him that question. Like, what was your inspiration to say, this is what I wanted to do? Was it your grandmother's style? Was it that she collected fashion magazines? Right. Like, it would be a fascinating just like yeah. to pick his brain because yeah. that is also a time you have a lot of gatekeeper. Right. And it's very, very racist. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you have like one model only on, on like anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, it, it would be really interesting, but I think it like, wouldn't be coffee, would be like champagne with him. Right, absolutely. <laughs> champagne or a fantastic glass of red or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, he's one, and yeah. then total opposite side of the spectrum, my grandfather. So, you know, it's just, I never hmm. really got to ask him some questions. How is it that you became such an established tailor in a very small parish? Right in Jamaica huh. that I end up going to New Orleans and finding a restaurant owned by a Jamaican who you made his suits to Oh my go God, to the US. wow. Exactly. So as I'm older and I things like that happen where my path crosses with someone that my grandfather like touched. Like full circle moment kind of thing. And I'm like, oh my God, how is it that you did that? You wow. know, it, where they came from was very poor, very humble beginnings. And I'm like, how is it that you were one of the tailors that people came from across the island to have make their suits. And where did he learn his craft? Exactly. Wow. Exactly. I think he went to England. Huh. Um, I have aunts and uncles who went to England to yeah. learn a trade, but that was before my mother, and he taught my mother what she knows. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then they tried to teach me, and it didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> want to be behind a sewing machine in Jamaica. I'm in Jamaica. I wanted to be outside. I wanted to run up and down. I was a tomboy as a kid. I wanted mm. to climb trees. I wanted to, you know, chase the goats around the property, you know, climb and get mangoes. I wasn't interested <laughs> in sitting behind this. It, and as a little kid, this machine was huge. Were you like on that spinning with my the head? Whole, oh my God, you're so... old black singer. And I'm just like, I have visions of my father, tr grandfather trying to pick me up and put me on his lap on, wow. in, behind this singer. And I was just, I hated it. I wanted to go. Okay, so this like go back way, way back. So sewing machine needs to have no electricity. Mm -hmm. You have so to pump it. You pump, <laughs> or you use your hand, and roll yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's how you stitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what behind the scene detail about costume design that fascinate you? What fascinates me? The fact that all these little minions and people and little a lot and of running around <laughs> create these beautiful pieces of art. Yeah. I, it never ceases to amaze me because in, in it, you're in it. And all you're seeing is the work and the hard work and the drama and the hours. And then this film or this movie or TV series and you look back and you're like, wow, that looks great. We did that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, very proud. We did that. And then I feel proud and I forget all the shit. <laughs> Excuse me, bleep. But yeah, I, um, it, it just fascinates me what we're able to accomplish. Yeah. But that, isn't that what life is? Isn't yeah. That, right? We usually remember like one moment. Yeah. We don't remember a lot of stuff behind it. Yeah, yeah. And then we kind of like elaborate how beautiful that experience was. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it doesn't even need to finish. It could just be we prepped for a scene. Yeah. And I'm behind the monitor and I look in the monitor and it's all come together. And I have an aha moment. Like, wow, we did that. That's why we did this. Yeah, it looks incredible. And then I turn around and I'm... <laughs> Good job, costumer. Well, not only just costume. Yeah. But the um, whole crew, everybody. Whole crew, yeah. the, Everything the comes set together. set decoration, the props, the lighting, like the frame, the entire, everything that's in that frame it all just there. came together yeah. and made this beautiful image. Wow. You know? 
you're a child of Jamaica mm -hmm. and you grew up in Toronto mm -hmm. and your family are in the cloth business, mm -hmm. your grandpa is a tailor mm -hmm. and your mom is a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. How is this uh, influence you in uh, when you do costume? You know, in the beginning it didn't influence me because I rebelled against it like nobody's business. They'd say come in the shop and I'd run the other way. But now that I'm older and I've done a little bit of everything it feels like within this business, I really see that that was the base. That was instilled in me from a very early age. And my grandfather, even though I hated being in the shop behind that big singer, I regret not learning from him. So how has it inspired me and influenced me? I think it's made me who I am. Mm. You know? How did your experience as a model influence your skill as a costume designer? <laughs> People would be surprised how much influence being a model has with what I do. One of the things that I now realize, just even thinking back and doing research for a few things, being a model helped me to be organized. You had to be really on your game with timing, being on time, you couldn't be late. And sometimes you're running from one job to the next with very little time in between. So my bag, which I thought about it this morning, is packing my bag for several Everything ready. Days. Yeah, <laughs> had to be ready from one thing to the next, you know. So organization, I think, was, was key. And I learned that at a very early age as a model. And people skills. Got a people lot of work because you have to deal with so many with different so departments. So many different the people, whether it was the creative, you know, the client, the model, the, you know, it, it could even be something as simple as on location doing a commercial and dealing with real people who are there or ADs. And it just, I think we learned to be quiet when we're needed and to speak up when needed and just having strength within yourself to, how should I put it? I learned to believe in me and my voice at a very early age, and I contribute that to modeling. Right. I really do. So speaking up, I think one of the most important thing has a costume designer because mm -hmm. you're in a meeting, mm -hmm. they have a certain way yeah. of doing things. It does, it teaches you confidence. Yeah. I never really thought of that, about that before, but I remember starting out in the business as a costume designer and I'd have producers say, you're arrogant. And I was shocked. It's like, I'm not doing anything different. Because you're a woman? That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> whole other conversation. Yes. But I didn't think I was any different than how I was when I was 16 or 18 or 25 and saying, hey, I'm really cold, or this is not working, can we try something? Like, be, speaking up for myself, and in meetings in costume design, sometimes you have to go out on a limb and speak up to be heard, because yeah. they don't think costumes has anything to do with anything, and then when you start asking the questions, or bringing up points, well, this is great for so-and-so, but it doesn't really work for costumes, and this is why. I didn't think anything was wrong. Or, right. or, or was wrong with doing that. But several times, in, especially in the early days, people would look at me as like, almost like you should wait till you're asked to speak. And I'm really? like, yeah, but we're talking about this right now. Yeah. So let's address it right now. So yeah. for somebody who are starting out, I think really we're going through a, a period right now, a lot of the, you know, Gen Z coming up. So oh, young yeah. women, yeah. how would they speak up? This generation, the Gen Zs, the millennials, they have a different voice than we did back in the day. Yes. They are much more forthcoming, much more proactive, much more aggressive in getting their points across. Yeah. I felt that, you know, without aging myself, back in the 80, late 80s and early 90s, you had to really watch your P's and Q's and you didn't want to insult or you had to be sensitive. <laughs> yeah. The only advice- Yeah, a lot I, of gatekeeper. Yeah, right? <laughs> But if anything, what I would recommend this generation and these up and coming, you know, artists do is read the room. That's where my not a hard back scale. comes up and it's like, you're not reading the room. You're so quick to be heard, to be seen, to get your point across that you're not assessing, is this the right time 
to jump on that. And I know some of that comes with experience, but like I said earlier, learning to be quiet and knowing when to be quiet and just listen. That's a skill. What your passion outside costume design and how do they influence your creative work? Wow, that's a hard one. I mean, anyone who knows me well knows I love music. I'm a foodie. I've always been a foodie. You know, I'm pretty open. Does that make sense? It's like people say, what do you like? It's more about what I don't like. So what <laughs> would kind of like a pick you up uh, song that you would go to? Bob Marley. Mm. Uh, without fault, there has never been a time that I haven't put reggae on and the right kind of reggae. I'm kind of specific with my reggae for moods. I come from the lover's rock generation, which is Jimmy Cliff, um, Bob Marley, obviously. And I don't know that I can be in a funk and listen to reggae and not have it take me out of that funk. I love it. Barris Hammond. I mean, I can go on. I'm, a little I'm bit Jamaican swaving, too. Little, yeah, a little bit, right? you know, just a little <laughs> bit. Rock into the music, you know? And it, you know, she like started show with the movement in music. It actually does change your... Uh, yeah, your it just yeah. headspace. I could literally... I mean, back in the day, I'd put on the speakers and blast it. But now, depending on where I am and people's energy, I mean, I, I was in Italy. I turned them on to reggae. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I also sometimes like... I mean, I remember my early days in the 90s when I first started designing. I needed house music to do the lineup. It would be like house music. Oh, no. And I'd be playing the house music and and pulling the clothes and the shoes and dancing down the rolling rack, you know? So yeah. I, I love music. And um, I've discovered Prosecco Fridays, you know? Like, why not have a pick me up? We made it through the week. <laughs> Celebrate the end of a hard week. What one significant challenge you have faced in your career how did it shape your approach? I was accustomed working in Canada and being a minority, one being a woman, one being black, one being in an industry that costumes, as, even as important as we think it is, not everyone felt the same way. It, so I always felt like there was always this uphill battle of things I had to climb over. but. I would honestly say it's more traveling and not being pigeonholed into you are a black designer, you do black films. I'm a costume designer. First I'm and foremost. First and foremost. Well, actually, if you want to rewind, I'm a woman <laughs> who's a costume designer who's also a woman of color. So that all is my makeup. But that woman can do any project that interests her or you feel she's qualified for. This segregation in this century of still trying to keep us in one lane, I don't have any time for. No. And I really, really go for projects that I find excite me, that interest me, that when I read a script, I dive into the script and I'm walking, talking, feeling those characters. It could be a black project. The harder they fall, I didn't even think about the fact that all the characters were black. I just thought, oh my God, a Western. I've never done that before. It's a very you cool know. visual. True. Yeah. It was a cool movie. Yeah. Gravitated me to it was doing something different. And that's what, what I, I find that has been a challenge is, whoa, don't, why am I, don't put me over here. What's over here? You know? And that like, your take on that question is also very interesting. I I would just saw like you know some of the uh, the visual in them. So what are some of the things that? How did you came up with that? Because that a very different way of telling that story just, compared to like you know the traditional yeah. the the very kind of like basic like you know when you see a question like people behave and you know wear certain way that Dusty you're not dirty cowboy movie. exactly yeah. yeah yeah, yeah. No. you're not like your visual mm -hmm. like very pacific i'm like looking at like I, these characters have a very pacific style to them yeah yeah and it influence the way they move yes they absolutely. don't realize that costume influence the way really? actor move yeah <laughs> and we'll get to that in a second because yeah. i have a story for you about boots and making an actor walk a certain way <laughs> but <laughs> 
it started with the director yeah. and the producer because when I interviewed for that project I did have a lot of the traditional classic um, Victorian Western images mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that was not the movie that they wanted to make and I would like to say that I did my my research which is where I usually start but not just research of what the script entailed I did research of who was making the movie and realized that these are people who are very stylish spe very stylistically I mean specific I mean James Samuel loves Japanese cost clothing he wears a lot of Japanese designers mixed with urban wear Jay-Z has a very eclectic street look that's very high-end um, he can make a tracksuit, a nylon, tr you know, an 80s nylon tracksuit look like high fashion. It's very There's Pacific some, DNA. Yeah, but something told me these guys would want to see more. Yeah. So I threw fashion images. I remember finding these incredible Vogue layouts of women in Western-inspired clothes. And I threw some of that in. Mm. And that's what my director loved and wanted to see more of. And he kept asking for more of that kind of Western fashion that was inspired by Western. I realized, whoa, this is the movie they want to make. It's a stylized Western. Yeah. And so I gave it to them and they loved it. And I got the job and that became the mandate is how do we put a swagger? That was a word James used a lot swagger how do we put swagger on this that they look sexy they look street they look like they could be now but not yeah so it was a fine line of where I could do that and where I still had to stamp the period to make the base it had to be grounded in something so it was grounded in late Victorian and then I just gave it a little twist twi tweak it yeah and the little story with the boot? Oh my God. <laughs> well, you know what? The actor, Jonathan Majors, was my muse. He was the first actor I was given. And we found a boot style that he liked. And we were going to custom him. Jeff Jeffrey Campbell from Toronto did all my boots mm. for that movie. And But what I wanted from that traditional classic cowboy boot was I streamlined it so it was a little bit more contemporary and mm. I gave it a chunkier stronger heel oh. and when I did that it just shifted his the gait weight. and his weight and how he strode in that boot and then of course he wanted one and he wore it all the time so he either wore it in his personal life or wore it on set and it just affected how he moved but he did that on purpose and I thought that was if any time, one of the first, well, mm. it's the second, but the f times that I saw that from the ground up, from the footwear, mm. I cha helped an actor find that character through their boot, through their wow. feet. Yeah. That's amazing. It was cool. Yeah. Right. I talked to some of my friends who are a customer mm -hmm. uh, that I'd be talking to you. They're very excited. Oh. You have a huge heel influence on them and uh. such a good reputation in the industry. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I replayed a, a few things and I put a few of them together. So, okay. um, how do you communicate your vision to your crews? And what tactic or method do you use to ensure everyone aligns with your ideas? It's different for every project. Yes. And also, it's different depending on the location I'm in. What may work in Italy may not work in Australia, All right. you know, and um, some people are more visual, so they, they get, they understand it from, you know, touching and feeling, Tactile. and some people are great just going on a Pinterest, Pinterest board visual. and visual yeah. and seeing it. So one of the things I, start, I did that I found was really effective for the harder they fall just because I did it to create a resource for my library was I did Pinterest categories so you know I, I did Pinterest boards that had the references and sometimes I added to Pinterest from outside of Pinterest so it mm. wasn't just all pulled in Pinterest yeah but I do the color theory 
and have the references and the colors. So they literally could pull up Pinterest on their phone and go to women's hats and see the selection of hats I pulled that was a digital board because we were pulling from multiple places um, in the U.S. and in Canada for the Heart of Day Fall. Um, and that was pre-COVID. But I also sometimes do boards, the hard boards. I'm still a believer in picking up a board and speaking to it in a group. And that's really good for when you're doing background, you know, and um, crowd if you're in the Europe, you could say crowd or Australia. But having the story on a board helps. And remember I mentioned I'm a night person? They can, may come in the next morning and see it's the whole done. movie <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> in, their, in my space, in, you know, in, the, in my office, it could be in the fitting room. It could even be I'm speaking with the age or dyer or yeah. art finisher, depending on what they are. And we're putting things on the wall as we're talking. And then you turn around and after a few minutes of speaking to what we're talking about, you've got the story behind us. So it all depends. I try to keep it fluid yeah. so that it's not, this is the way I work and this is how I show because I've come to realize that different, I call them all artists, we're all artists, different artists receive differently. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because like I, I remember lear when I was teaching, you have to learn they're a person of tactile, the person who feel, the person who do visual. Yeah. So you have to communicate with that. That's yeah. how their language is. Yeah. So yeah. So um, talking about reference, we're in a really iconic space. <laughs> this is the Kafka Library. <laughs> I, I'm a founding member of Kafka, and when we started, uh, thank you. When we started Kafka, um, we lost someone very dear to us from our costume community, Vicky Grave. Yeah. And Vicky's entire library collection, her all her books from her career, were donated to CAFCAD. And that's when we realized this was an amazing opportunity to start a library, to create a library for our members. And we accepted donations and built, I mean, this is just a small part of the library. Um, these Harper's Bazaars are from me. Um, <laughs> they're vintage Harper's Bazaars. But we donated, and it could just be editing out our, our collection. Um, there are people like Ian Drummond who donated amazing catalogs and, and reference materials. I think it's special. I've come back to Toronto several times and made it a point to come to the library. I just did. Uh, a movie in Australia that were about pirates. I found a pirate book. I couldn't find a pirate book in LA at the library, at the Western Library online, but I found a pirate book with beautiful illustrations, black and white illustrations, Technical detail. in the Kafka library. Wow. Yeah. What are the most memorable costume you have ever designed, and why does it stand out for you? Wow. You know what? It's always up there for me with probably my favorite, and I think it's become iconic, is the orphan blue dress. The little girl's dress. It's probably one of the simplest designs ever. I mean, it was classic. It was supposed to be sort of like a uniform, um, period, but not period. That costume comes out at Halloween. No, wow. yeah, little mini orphans running around. Mm. And it was the blueprint to do the movie in the series that's being done now. That tweaking her costumes and finding that note of old school, classic, but dated and just off was really hard. And that dress, I had, I think, 15 or 20. That was the first time I really knew what it took to make costumes that had different compartments in the inside, different layering, that it went from a size 12 child to an adult woman, small woman for stunts. 
I mean, I had a whole truck pretty much devoted to this child and wow. all her multiples with her costumes. So I'd say Orphan was probably, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's the most That's stand out, stand out yeah. you know, costume for me. Yeah. How do you handle the collaboration between yourself and other key department, like set design and makeup to ensure a cohesive visual story in a film? A lot of patience. <laughs> I mean, you know, you try to connect with each department. Um, I have a pet peeve. I'm going to put it out there publicly. You know, I try to be respectful of each department in their time and connect with them, introduce myself, let them know who I am, give them my contact information if, it's, if we haven't got a crew list, and just say, let's connect, let's get together, let's find some time to go through or share, figure out a way to share if we're just too busy to meet at this time. There's nothing worse than you're in the middle of a meeting, you're in the middle of a creative problem solving with your someone in your department, and the entire hair and you know, makeup department walks in and wants to see what we're doing. Okay? And I bring <laughs> this up because, you know, at times I feel like it comes off like I don't want to collaborate or I don't want to connect with them. But I appreciate that you've started now and we're going to camera in a couple of weeks or whenever they start. But you've had ample time to reach out to me so we could start the dialogue. But just walking into my office because you're now on, you know, in the building or your truck is just rolled up. And I'm, I, I found, I'm sorry if this sounds really negative, but it's just, I, would, I try to show people courtesy and I just find sometimes those lines are blurred in our business. Yes. So I try to be respectful of people's time and um, even that they may have just started and they may not have anything to share. Let's just even connect to say hi and introduce ourselves and circle back when we have information that we can give each other. What is the best piece of advice you ever received? How has it shaped your career? Ah. <laughs> ah, that's a stumper. I received very early in my career that I need to play the game. And you hear a, a term a lot, which I never understood in the beginning. Mm. It's like, I need to be able to break bread with you. And I'm like, why? Here's my portfolio. Here's no. my website. Here's my reel. Do I qualify? And what that person was saying to me at the time is we're going to be spending a lot of time together, sometimes in remote areas where we are the only people and we are our dinner dates, our breakfast dates. I see you in the morning when I get up. I see you at the end of my day. We need to be able to coexist not only in work, at work, but off site or off hours. And... Now that I'm traveling sometimes with a group to different locations, I understand that really yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the things I find is like mm -hmm. when, um, when I work in hiring people, because like usually I tell people, by the time you're already here, mm -hmm. you're already qualified. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So how are you going to connect with the rest of us or how you bring in that energy and yeah. And that's very important. And very, I think, very. yeah, and we were talking about Gen Z, how to read the room. Yeah, reading the room. Right? Good one. So that, this is one of those things. So yeah. as a new person who's coming up, um, learn to read the room and learn to like connect with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very important because we're going to spend like 20 hour days together, yeah, like yeah. literally sometime. Yeah. And literally like your lack of sleep. And, and also too, understanding that not to take things personally. Yep. This is still a business. At work. You know, we're at work. It's still a business. Yeah. So where do you see the future of costume design heading? Especially in a world where that becoming more digital and globalization. You know, it's interesting that you say that because there's so much talk about AI and what that means to our industry. And for the first time, I think I had a producer say to me recently, why are you using an illustrator? Why are you working with a, a, a real concept artist? Why don't you just do it through one of the AI programs? Mm. And 
there are there are people in our industry who are keen and interested in jumping on that and then there's others who are like no i'm not ready and it's like how do we find that that middle ground because it's not going to go anywhere and some of us use a program called canva which is you know graphics in digital presentation format canva and ai just created a baby and what does that mean to us <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. and now you can literally have Canva create a presentation just by prompts. I don't know. I just worry about with so much technology advancement that we lose what makes it individual, what makes it different, what makes it have personality, yeah. you know? And I think that brings back to the thing that we just talked earlier when you're talking about, you know, you go into that Western movie, you mm -hmm. have one set of idea or something. And I think that when you build promise stuff like that, you have those idea. No. But in person, yeah. think evolve and change at the tactile thing. Yeah. You talk to the people, read in the room, feel that energy and they say, oh, that, I'd have this thing, but it's not really this. So now I have to shift direction. Yeah. And I think that like that where it could be interesting because AI computer can pick the room. Yeah. It's only gonna pick up what we tell them to, to exactly. do. Exactly. So I think that would be fascinating. Rapid fire word association. Action. Oh my god, do I have to do another stunt movie? <laughs> <laughs> I am <laughs> Action has become my behind my name costume designer credit. Action movies, yeah. I I stunt. <laughs> yeah, stunt movies. Like I'd love to do a very character driven, beautiful story with a couple and a dog. Just saying. <laughs> brave. Wow, you know what? You have to be brave, really do to be in this industry. It's it is incredibly soul it takes everything you have you have to run at 110 yeah all the time. It, you you can't be a wimp in this business no. you've got to be strong you've got to be brave you've got to put your put everything out there yeah. to keep moving forward yeah yeah do not sleep on the opportunities seriously they're so as canadians we tend to be a little bit more reserved and sometimes shy of taking that step or seizing that opportunity you can't there's 50 people chomping behind you and if the opportunity presents itself jump all over yeah. it and the higher you are and the more you know experience you are the more people behind you question <laughs> oh my god are people asking you when is two coming so, <laughs> there's a there's a there's westerns in my future that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I didn't say nothing. It coming <laughs> all from you. <laughs> Silhouette. You know what? It's interesting that that word is thrown at me. What is a silhouette? And do customers understand the importance of the silhouette? I think a lot of people don't understand now. Yeah. Like, I came from old school. Yeah. It's all about the silhouette right. before anything else. Before anything else. And I literally see people glaze over when you say that word now because they don't know what it means, Yeah. right? And I have to be careful how I use it because I recognize that people don't know what I mean when I say, let's talk about the silhouette and what it means to this character. Yeah. So yeah, good one. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Oh, it was a pleasure. Queen. <laughs> No, it's like, <laughs> I am so impressed with everything you do. Oh, thank you so much. And are doing. And yeah. thank you. Ciao. Thank you.